Goeiemorgen, Gratens. Vandaag gaan ons weer terug gaan na module 1.7 en 1.8 sommer so gelijktijdig doen. En ek gaan vir julle een paar video's wees, wat net weer vir jou gaan illustreer wat ons in hierdie twee lesse al reeds bespreek het. Saam met dit natuurlijk wil ek ook hier moet julle asjeblief vir my een bykie huiswerk gaan bijdoen. Doen vir my asjeblief vir huiswerk modele 1.7 se invulvraagies. Ek het hierdie vraagies al reeds vir jou op die WhatsApp groepie gesit. As jy nog nie op die WhatsApp groep is nie, kontak asjeblief een van jou vriende of laat iemand vir, jou, vir hulle vraag om net jou selfenommer na my toe te stuur. Dan sal ek jou op ons groep gaan add. Goed, kom ons kyk nou, wat kan jy leer uit die video's oor modele 1.7 en 1.8? A computer system consists of two major elements, hardware and software. Computer hardware is the collection of all the parts you can physically touch. Computer software, on the other hand, is not something you can touch. Software is a set of instructions for a computer to perform specific operations. You need both hardware and software for a computer system to work. Some hardware components are easy to recognize, such as the computer case, keyboard, and monitor. However, there are many different types of hardware components. In this lesson, you will learn how to recognize the different components and what they do. Before looking at the various components, it is useful to distinguish between two different types of computers, desktop computers and laptop computers. A desktop computer consists of a computer case and a separate monitor, keyboard, and mouse. As the name suggests, this type of computer is typically placed on a desk and is not very portable. A laptop computer has the same components, but integrated into a single portable unit. While these two types of computers look quite different, they have the same general hardware components. Let's start with the computer case. This is the metal enclosure that contains many of the other hardware components. It comes in various shapes and sizes, but a typical tower model is between 15 to 25 inches high. Want to know what's inside? Okay, go get a screwdriver and let's open it up. Seriously, if you are really into computers, the best way to learn is to actually get hands-on. To save us some time, however, have a look at this desktop computer case. A computer enthusiast replaced the metal side panel with a transparent one so we can have a look inside. Although that photo looks pretty cool, it is a bit hard to recognize the individual components, especially with all the connecting wires running through it. This figure shows a more schematic version of a desktop computer, which makes it easier to point out the essential hardware components. The computer case contains a power supply unit, number 6, to convert general purpose electricity to direct current for the other components. The most critical component is the motherboard, number 2, a plastic board on which several essential components are mounted. This includes the central processing unit, or CPU, number 3, the main memory, number 4, and expansion slots, number 5 for other hardware components. The internal hard disk drive, number 8, serves as the mass storage device for data files and software applications. An optical disk drive, number 7, makes it possible to read from and write to CDs and DVDs. Other hardware components typically found inside the computer case, but not shown in the figure, are a sound card, a video card, and a cooling mechanism such as a fan. A computer system also needs input devices such as a keyboard, number 9, and a mouse, number 10. To interact with a user, a computer system also needs a display device such as a monitor, number 1. The hardware components described so far result in a fully functional computer system. 
A user can provide input using the keyboard and the mouse, and the computer can process instructions, read and write information, and display the results on the monitor. Most present-day computer systems have additional hardware components to provide more functionality. These include input devices, such as a microphone and video camera, and output devices, such as speakers. These can be integrated into the other hardware components or connected as external devices. Additional peripheral devices can be connected to the computer systems, such as an image scanner to input paper documents as digital files, a printer to print out documents, and an external hard disk drive for extra mass storage. The hardware components described here are all part of a personal computer. Other types of hardware are needed for a computer network and for the infrastructure that supports the Internet but those types of hardware are not covered here. Computer hardware is a general term to describe all the physical parts of a computer system. A typical computer system consists of a computer case, a power supply unit, a motherboard, a central processing unit, CPU, main memory, and a hard disk drive. Input devices include a keyboard, mouse, microphone, video camera, and image scanner. Output devices include a monitor, speakers, and a printer. Input devices are the way we're able to get data into a computer. There are several methods to input data, and generically they are keyboards, mice, audio, and video. Most people just accept whatever comes with their machine, but we'll do a little shopping trip to discover what might be most useful for you. A keyboard is a keyboard, right? I mean, you type on them to write a paper or enter data on a form for online shopping. So is there really anything else to think about? There can be. We have some unique keyboards available to use. Laser projected, though these are typically used for smaller devices like smartphones. Foldable, create your own used by gamers, or ergonomic. Keyboards can also be connected to your computer by a wire or by using wireless technology. Most keyboards are laid out in the QWERTY style. If you look at the top row of your keyboard left side, you'll see Q-W-E-R-T-Y. This layout evolved to actually slow the typist down. Yes, I said slow them down. Typewriters, first in a manual, then in electric, are machines that used a striking arm to hit an inked ribbon on a piece of paper. The typists were getting so fast, the typewriter arms were getting twisted up with each other. The typist had to stop, untangle the arms, and then return to work. This significantly slowed down their speeds. By creating a QWERTY keyboard, the speeds balanced out, thereby increasing their overall productivity. The standard keyboard that comes with a computer is perfectly functional. The question is in how it affects your hands and forearms. Take a second here and do a quick study with me. Push your keyboard out of the way or out of reach. Set your hands on the work surface. Just plop them down. Don't pay attention to where they're going. Now, look down at them. Notice the angle your elbows are at as well as your wrists. This is an example of ergonomics or the study of physical work habits and how they affect the muscle and skeleton of the employee. Your elbows are probably slightly away from your sides and bent at about a 45 degree angle. Your wrists are probably not bent and your fingers are pretty straight. Now if you pull your keyboard back to its normal position and place your fingers on the home row. For those of you still hunting and pecking, the left pinky finger will be on the A, with the remaining left fingers on the S, D, and F. Your right index finger will be on the J, with the remaining three fingers on the K, L, and semicolon. Unless you're using a split, curved, or naturals keyboard, all ergonomic in design, you will find the angles of your wrist and forearm significantly different than when you just rested them on your desk. Using an ergonomic keyboard takes a while to get used to and will temper user use your typing speeds, but they are much better for you and will help prevent carpal tunnel and other repetitive motion syndromes. Computer mice are also available in ergonomic styles, though we have a tendency to worry less about the mouse than the keyboard. They can be wired or wireless with or without a scrolling wheel. A mouse is used to input instructions or data by sending a signal to the computer based on hovering the cursor and selecting with the left mouse button. The left mouse acts as a do this or enter button. 
The right mouse button can be selected and will often pop up a window of choices. The scrolling wheel is used to move the view of the screen up or down. By moving your mouse to a location in a document, on a digital photo, or over a choice of music, you can click the left mouse button to place the cursor. A standard mouse is a rounded square in physical appearance and is typically split into three regions. The left button, a right button, and a top base. Some examples of ergonomics are the trackball and optical ergo. Like with an ergonomic keyboard, the more you use a mouse, the better the ergonomic mouse will feel to your wrist. If you have existing tightness, you may even find relief by switching to an ergonomic mouse. Just give yourself some time to adjust to it. You might be thinking, what do you mean audio input? By definition, it's the entry of data by some type of audio device. Examples of audio input devices would include microphones or even MP3 players. When we say microphone, we're not saying that you're singing to your computer, though you certainly could be, or playing drums, piano, or a guitar. In my case, I'm using a high-quality microphone to record the audio for this lesson. My French brother-in-law uses a headset with a microphone when he plays online games with his friends from home. It's still input, even though it's not being recorded. Now, I don't know about you, but I love to use my digital camera and my video camera. I can save my photos or videos to SD cards, and they become the input device, or I can plug my camera directly into the computer and the camera acts as the input device. Video is another source of input. Besides the video camera, an example might be a touch screen. Video input is the use of visual-based technology to enter data into a computer. This is becoming more available to consumer users. Can you think of others besides consumers who use touch screen? No? Think of your last trip to a restaurant. Most fast food chains and even sit down restaurants use touch screen technology. Many retail establishments are also using a combination of barcode scanners and touch screen monitors for their sales. You may have used this if you've gone through a self checkout at a grocery store or created a pet tag at a kiosk. A relatively new way of video input is the screen capture. Specialized software is installed on your computer and can be used to capture what is on your screen. This may be a challenge to picture in your mind, so let me explain the process we use to create these videos. The instructor records the audio to the lesson using screen capture software and a high quality microphone. The audio is stored on track one of the file. They may also use a tablet input device, which is a digitized surface, and a stylus pen to send input signals to the monitor or even a presentation software package. The tablet or the presentation will be active on the monitor when we record, and this video part saves to track two. As we progress through the audio recording, we will make notes to the video production team as examples or suggestions to make this fun and exciting for you. It remains a mystery to me how they do such an awesome job, but this gives you a fun example to see how all the different inputs are used just through this one process. So to wrap it up, the keyboard is used to input data by keystroke to a computer. The mouse is used to input instruction by placement typically over a command button. Audio input is the use of a microphone to input sound into a system. And finally, video inputs use touch screen monitors or screen capture or digital cameras to send signals to the system. Computers have many complex pieces. On the motherboard, you will find many things including the central processing unit, random access memory, and read-only memory. The most vital piece is the CPU. The CPU is the brains of the computer. The central processing unit has to think through every instruction generated by your use of the computer. These instructions include having the arithmetic logic unit, ALU, performing the logarithmic calculations to interpret these instructions. The processing is done at a speed that is nearly impossible for our brains to comprehend, let alone actually perform. Speeds are referred to with the term Hertz, H-E-R-T-Z, not the car rental, by the way. The speeds are actually in the millions, mega, or billions, giga, machine cycles per second. Think of it as revolutions per minute in an engine, but a heck of a lot faster. The path of thinking includes volatile and non-volatile memory, or temporary and permanent, respectively. Random access memory, RAM, is volatile or temporary memory. It wakes up when you turn on your computer and holds the information you're working on. Think of those different windows being open in the programs you're using. Those sit in RAM when you're working on them. They're right there up front for easy access and processing. An even more upfront memory is called the cache, or C-A-C-H-E. 
It's simply another form of working memory. Because it is volatile, it will empty when the computer is shut off. Cache is located on or near the CPU. It holds instructions that are repetitive for program use. Because of its proximity to CPU, the cache doesn't have to take the long way to work, the system bus. The bus is an electronic line that sends and receives data. As soon as the machine is shut down, both RAM and the cache are cleared out. RAM is located in slots on the motherboard and is measured in storage capacity of megabytes or just over one million bytes or gigabytes over one billion. The more RAM installed on a computer combined with a CPU which has high processing speed, the stronger the computing power will be. For today's basic user and personal computer shopper, some RAM acronyms may be confusing. In-depth analyses of each are not necessary, but note the progression of today's technology. Regular RAM RAM was the original. SRAM, or static RAM, this is constant and doesn't refresh, kind of like the humming of an electric line. SD RAM, or synchronous dynamic RAM, in this the refresh signal comes when the user is processing some input, we wouldn't even notice the wait. You could think of this like the crew of a rowing team. They all work in unison. DRAM or dynamic RAM refreshes frequently, like when you need refreshing from being on the beach all day. And finally, DDR1, DDR2, and DDR3 RAM is the progression for double data rate RAM. The process is synchronous, as is the SD RAM, but it has stricter control of signals. DDR3 RAM is the current consumer purchasable version of RAM. If RAM is temporary, then what's permanent? Permanent memory does not disappear when the machine is powered off as RAM does. Read-only memory, or ROM, is used to begin the startup process for your computer. As soon as you press the power on button, system checks are performed and the operating system startup instructions that are stored in ROM execute. You may notice this on a Windows machine. It now keeps a black background. You see the Windows logo fly in and it says starting Windows. All those system checks that were stored in ROM are going on at that time. This allows your operating system to fully execute and let you then fire up the software you want to work with. Because ROM is permanent, it does not disappear when the machine is powered off as RAM does. Remember, RAM is temporary or volatile and stores information currently being used in the front of the electrical path of the computer for quick access. ROM, or the non-volatile read-only memory, permanently holds the operating system and is used for system startup. Finally, the central processing unit, or brains of the computer, and the arithmetic logic unit, or ALU, are located on the motherboard and quickly think through and calculate every instruction thrown at them. Without these, your computer cannot function and you can't use it. Have you ever Googled your name? What did you find out about yourself? Like many people, you may have been a bit surprised about the information that could be obtained about you through a simple internet search. Information technology has opened up society and decreased privacy. Privacy continues to diminish as technological innovation progresses. Privacy is the right to be left alone and free from surveillance and unreasonable personal intrusions. Information privacy is the right to determine when and to what extent information about oneself can be communicated to others. This applies to individuals, groups, and institutions. Privacy can be interpreted quite broadly, which contributes to the debate concerning privacy expectations and availability of personal information. However, the following two rules have been followed fairly closely in past court decisions in many countries. The right of privacy is not absolute and must be balanced against the needs of society, and the public's right to know is superior to the individual's right of privacy. These two rules reveal why it is difficult in some cases to determine and enforce privacy regulations. There are a number of privacy issues that are of concern, including electronic surveillance, availability of personal information, cookies and spyware, and workplace monitoring. Detective Brown and Detective Smith are staking out a building located in a bad part of town. Their beat-up van sits inconspicuously along the street, giving nothing away about whom they are or why they are there. The detectives are gathering information through electronic surveillance to take down an organized crime ring that has wreaked havoc on the city and contributed to the rise in crime. Electronic surveillance involves monitoring people with technology often without their knowledge. Video recordings, photography, and audio recordings are common electronic surveillance techniques. Detectives Brown and Smith photograph everyone going in and out of the suspect building. They will use the photographs to identify the key players in the crime ring. 
They have also planted cameras and audio devices within the building to capture conversations and keep a real-time watch on the movements within the building. All of this information is recorded from the van and saved to build a strong case. You don't have to be a criminal to come in contact with electronic surveillance. We are all likely to encounter various forms of electronic surveillance throughout the day. Some communities use video surveillance to catch those who violate traffic laws. You may receive a ticket in the mail for running a red light or failing to pay a toll. When you go to the bank, withdraw money from the ATM, or enter your local convenience store, you're probably being recorded on video. Your apartment building or workplace may be equipped with video surveillance to discourage crime and assist in resolving crimes if they do occur. The house next door to you has just been sold. Your new neighbor moves in. He is a middle-aged man who keeps to himself and does not appear to be very friendly. He keeps odd hours and comes across as very strange. Your attempts to welcome him to the neighborhood have failed since he never answers the door. You wonder about him and find your mind getting carried away with all the possibilities. You wish you had more information to go on. You probably wouldn't go to the trouble of scouring City Hall documents, rooting through his trash, or tracking down friends and relatives to interview. However, if you could spend a few minutes searching the World Wide Web for information, there is a much greater chance you would snoop around, wouldn't you? With information technology, it is relatively simple to find personal information on anyone you wish, including your new neighbor. A variety of information on individuals is kept in databases. These databases house information such as social security numbers, credit card numbers, medical histories, family histories, and more. Practically every organization has a database full of information on everyone they do business with. The concern with this is whether or not they should be collecting this information, what they will do with it, how secure it is, how accurate it is, and who it can be sold to. Personal data is increasingly made available in online databases, which can be accessed by search engines. You decide to jump on the internet and conduct a web search to learn more about your neighbor. You discover his age, his birth date, his previous addresses, employment, and much more. You learn that he moved from another state after his wife passed away due to an automobile accident. He took a new job in the area as a commercial pilot, which is why he never seems to be home and keeps odd hours. You also discovered how much he paid for his house, and that he ran a 5K race in 27 minutes and 33 seconds last year. Now you feel better about your new neighbor and decide maybe he isn't so weird after all. The question that concerns some is should personal information, like we discussed, be so readily available to the public? The availability of personal information shows no signs of slowing. In fact, courts and government agencies at all levels are increasingly making public records available online. Some find it troubling giving the sensitive information contained in the available documents. For instance, someone filing for bankruptcy must disclose their social security number, their bank and credit card numbers, account balances, and even children's names and ages. One of the fastest growing crimes has been identity theft. Identity theft is the stealing of another person's social security number, credit card number, or other personal information for the purpose of borrowing money, making purchases, and running up debts. In some cases, thieves even withdraw cash directly from the victim's bank account. Since many private organizations and governments keep information about individuals in accessible databases, there is an endless opportunity for thieves to retrieve it and misuse the information. Amy jumps on the internet from her home computer and goes to Amazon.com. She is automatically recognized by the website. In fact, it says, Hello Amy, in the upper right hand corner of the web page. On the top left side of the screen, she can click on Amy's Amazon.com and it takes her to her own personalized page of recommended products based on past purchases and searches. How does Amazon.com know so much about Amy? Websites can easily monitor consumer behavior without knowledge or consent. Vendors can track the movements of consumers with the use of cookies. Cookies are small data files that are written and stored on the user's hard drive by a website when that user visits the site with a browser. The cookie provides information within the website on pages visited, items examined, dates of visits, and even passwords. This information is stored in the cookie and sent back to the company. An even more intrusive technology is spyware. Spyware is a small computer program stored on the user's hard drive that collects users' habits and transmits that information to a third party, all without the user's consent. Spyware can monitor any website visited by the user, whereas cookies are specific to a particular website. Spyware can be installed when a user downloads software, especially freeware or shareware. A very common way to fall victim to spyware is by downloading peer-to-peer -peer file swapping products. Spyware also steals from the user by using up computer memory and consuming bandwidth. 
Since spyware uses memory and system resources, it can cause crashes and instability with your computer system. The reason that companies wish to gather so much consumer information is for targeted marketing and advertising. It is much more effective to send a user an advertisement specific to their likes rather than just a general advertisement. Companies value detailed information because they believe it enhances their capability to predict consumer preferences and behavior. Becky's boss Dave summoned her to his office. He wanted to discuss her attitude and use of technology in the office. You see, the day before, Dave was in a bad mood due to her fast approaching deadline. He was a bit harsh with Becky when she didn't have the paperwork he needed completed on time. He verbally reprimanded her and asked that she complete it immediately. Later in the day, once things had slowed down, Becky composed an email to her co-worker Debbie. Her email was mainly to vent about Dave. After she finished writing the email and reviewed it, she thought it was best just to delete it and not actually send it to Debbie. Today that email came back to haunt Becky. The IT department was able to retrieve the email through a special computer program they have installed on the network. It records keystrokes. Becky's boss had her deleted email in his hand. Technology has facilitated greater control over employees. Workplace monitoring is a growing trend. Many employers believe that monitoring is necessary to prevent loss of trade secrets, abuses of their computer networks, and inefficiency and loss of productivity through wasted time. On the other hand, many employees believe it's an invasion of privacy and a lack of trust. The lack of trust can decrease employee morale. Employees' email, voicemail, and web surfing habits may be monitored. There's a category of tools called Employee Internet Management, or EIM, software, and that filters and monitors employees' internet usage. Many Fortune 500 companies have adopted some form of EIM software. What some find disturbing is the expanding scope of workplace monitoring. Various software programs can be installed that will record every keystroke made by an employee. If an employee like Becky types up an angry email but decides to delete it before sending, every keystroke is still recorded. Some products at the disposal of employers will monitor all network activities and single out transactions or requests that appear out of order. Some employee monitoring programs that may be used by businesses are WorkTime by Nestorsoft Inc., ActiveTrack, ReefFog, Employee Monitoring, and WebWatcher, among many others. When we discuss privacy on the internet, we are referring to information privacy. Information privacy is the right to determine when and to what extent information about oneself can be communicated to others. Information technology has created a more open society where privacy grows scarcer with the development of each new technological innovation. The internet has made it possible to easily collect, exchange, and recombine personal information with ease. Spyware and cookies have enabled organizations to keep tabs on consumers and monitor their activities and habits on the internet for business purposes. Recall that cookies are small data files that are written and stored on the user's hard drive by website when that user visits the site with a browser. Spyware is a small computer program stored on the user's hard drive that collects users' habits and transmits the information to a third party, all without the user's consent. With more sophisticated surveillance equipment, people can be monitored with or without their knowledge by law enforcement or even their employer. Electronic surveillance involves monitoring people with technology, often without their knowledge. Employees' email, voicemail, and web surfing habits may be monitored. There's a category of tools called Employee Internet Management, or EIM software, that filters and monitors employees' internet usage.